One of the biggest films of last year was a movie called Bottoms, which joins the ranks of Superbad and Booksmart as a fun, comedic high school romp about desperate teenagers trying to get it on. Of these three movies, I think Bottoms is easily my favorite, with sharp writing, a more explicitly queer angle, and amazing acting, but what really stuck out to me on first blush was the soundtrack. Splitting the songwriting credits with Leo Burnenberg and with the help of regular collaborators A.G. Cook and George Daniel, Charlie XCX took the helm on this OST, and the result is a really invigorating blend of retro synth tones and more modern bubblegum bass style instrumentals. Both the film and soundtrack make subtle use of nostalgia to pull emotion from the viewer, but what struck me the most was not any piece of original music in the track list, but instead one piece of previously existing music, a song that makes an appearance right at the emotional climax of the movie at what should be a bittersweet but triumphant moment of victory for the characters. So many great pop bangers could have fit this moment, even within Charlie's extensive discography, but the song chosen is genuinely one of the most confusing and fascinating needle drop picks I've ever seen. As our entire cast of characters either languishes in defeat or relishes in victory together, we're met with a song from 2020, Party For You. I was floored. To this day, I am still not sure exactly how I feel about this as an artistic choice for the movie, but it's something that has had me thinking for months and months about what that song means to me and why I found it so emotionally dissonant to the film. I immediately went and re-listened to the album it's a part of, How I'm Feeling Now, and it pretty much confirmed my suspicions and so much more. This music was never meant to be listened to with other people. A lot of different pieces of art, movies, games, albums, have been called products of quarantine. Basically anything that was released in or during the year following that several months long stretch has received that label, and for good reason. I can't think of another period in my life where so much changed globally in such a short span of time, and with everyone given so much time alone to soak in the worldwide trauma, as well as unprecedented amounts of free time to consume media, it was unavoidable that people would develop bonds and associations with the art of this time. How I'm feeling now, though, is different. Not just released in time with the pandemic, or even created in parallel with it, the album used quarantine as a tool, an artistic limit that shaped it at every single turn. Songs were written and produced in isolation, with constant fan input and engagement at every step of the process by means of Zoom meetups and Instagram live streams. When the album fully released, less than six weeks after it had begun the writing process, it was our album. May 15th, 2020 was just far enough into the pandemic that we were forced to reckon with the fact that this wasn't just going to be a brief incident, but it wasn't far enough in that we could start to make plans or even predictions for the future. And How I'm Feeling Now came at the perfect time to be a cultural moment of separated togetherness, where nobody could see each other, but we all knew we were in this moment together. Today is not May 5th, 2020, though. As a matter of fact, I'm releasing this in May of 2024, exactly four years after the release of the album. Life is different now. I have a concert I'm going to tonight, I went to one last night, I'm going to another one tomorrow, I'm seeing my grandparents later this week, and friends on the weekend. For better or worse, quarantine is over, and yet I keep coming back. So much quarantine art has become pretty much disposable in a world post its creation. You won't see me rewatching Bo Burnham's Inside anytime soon, no matter how much I felt like I needed it in its moment. But something about Charlie's exploration of loneliness and grief for the future feels just as timeless as it is of its moment. Why is it that almost a half decade later, these songs still make me just as emotional as they did when I was locked away in my parents' house. Pink Diamond opens the album in bombastic fashion, with sharp and aggressive synths giving way to brooding but no less aesthetically jarring bass. 
Charlie's deadpan, almost rapping, pushes us forward through this intro track, which is sonically one of the most disorienting and haphazard tracks she's ever done. Claustrophobic and dense at every single level, with the repeated mantra of, I just want to go real hard, luring us into the trap that is this song, swarming the listener with a barrage of violent synths and a chaotic blend of electronic elements. It's a banger, but a hostile one, one that feels diametrically opposed to the party setting, completely inaccessible and just as cerebral as it is physical. In retrospect, it's easy to appreciate it on the basis of its sound design alone, but it's hard to overstate how of its moment it was when it came out. Having this confused, shut-in, and scared sounding track open up your quarantine album works as a genius way to set the tone, and while no track further into How I'm Feeling Now sounds anything like it, that feels important to its place in the album these days. Another banger, the track that immediately grabbed me and is still by far my most streamed song on the album, and is up there as one of my most streamed songs ever, is Claws, the second single. In a very similar way to the Go Real Hard refrain on the opening track, this one grabs listeners with its absolutely infectious I like, I like everything about you hook, which, while it could obviously be annoying to some, for me, it is completely irresistible, especially with the ways it's interwoven with possibly Dylan Brady's best instrumental to date. In 2020, I was completely on the hyperpop train, and knowing that this track was produced by half of 100 Gex was a full selling point, and while the genre is pretty much dead at this point, this track remains a highlight for me in the genre, and still one of my favorite pop songs ever released. I think if I had to pin down why that is, it would be the sense of true earnestness it portrays in the verses. Beyond the cutesy chorus, there's a real sense of adoration in the lyrics that is so heartwarming, a theme which continues into every other one of the best songs here. If there's one thing that has really helped this album age well, relative to all the other COVID projects I can think of and even more I've already forgotten, it's the fact that love, not frustration, runs through its core. The heartbreak of it is in the fact that we miss our friends and family. The sweetness is in the way that it brings us closer together. The high danceability of a track like Anthems does come from a place of pent up energy and feeling caged in by quarantine, but more specifically, it comes from a place of deep desire for human connection, the want to feel other bodies, to touch and to be touched, and to feel the innate human connection that can only come from being in a positive, crowded space. On the other hand, a more intimate and interpersonal love is put on display on tracks like Visions and especially Seven Years. There was a pretty popular social myth that if your relationship was able to survive being quarantined together, you were set for life, and well at this point, I think every single couple I know that survived COVID lockdown is no more, there's something about this track that makes me really want to believe it. There's such a confidence that comes from sharing such a large portion of your life with someone, and a freedom in knowing that you always have somewhere safe to return to. Four years later, I understand both the intimate and the lonely parts of how I'm feeling now more potently than I did back then. Maybe it's the fact that I'm older and have more faculties at my disposal to properly process and put words to what I feel, but in a very real way, I think this album is as made for me in this moment as it was for the world in 2020. There's been a lot of talk and coverage online about a loneliness epidemic that is sweeping across my generation and the ones directly surrounding it, and I'm no exception to those feelings. More so than I ever was in quarantine, when I was literally never seeing people face to face, I feel so lonely to a degree that feels almost incongruent to the life I lead. I go to concerts every other week, I am constantly seeing friends, and I live with my partner. I am, as Charlie puts it, feeling the heat from other bodies all the time, and yet I feel less connected to a community than I ever have. Thinking about it too hard, it's really easy for me to get angry because I do know where a lot of it comes from, and it's largely outside of my control. Four years later, COVID still exists, and people, myself repeatedly included, are still getting sick from it. It's frustrating to be the only person going to an event or public space who is still wearing a mask or taking any kind of precaution against it, 
only to still be the only one who ever seems to get sick, and to see the world act like that lived reality I have is no big deal, especially when I know I have it easy compared to all the people who either can't take precautions day to day or are immunocompromised either naturally or caused by the virus. Combine that unspoken social isolation with the fact that third spaces, a concept that has been getting a lot of talk lately, are basically non-existent as a place to socialize, and that making new friends face-to-face -face is harder and more risky than it ever has been, and it's no wonder I feel lonelier now than I did when I was on the computer every day, because at least back then I had time to call my friends and didn't have to worry about increasingly busy and rigid schedules conflicting all the time. A lot of it is my own responsibility too. I am terrible at making time to be social, especially when I need to work a full-time job and then somehow try to get a YouTube channel off the ground with what little spare time remains after that. Plus, I can't seem to use my free time to do other things that are actually important to me. But something about how I'm feeling now stops me from getting angry. It keeps my frustrations at bay. It's the love. It's an album that makes me feel safe and cared for in the moments I need it most, and one that feels like it loves me, unconditionally, forever. The first single for this record, accompanied by its music video, is one of the greatest pieces of art humanity has ever created. And I say humanity because this piece doesn't just belong to Charlie. This is all of ours. Forever is such a simple love song at its core, repeating the basic refrain of I will always love you, I love you forever, over and over, but the dramatic weight it's given by its production, then amplified by the music video, gives it a spiritual resonance that I am completely beholden to at any moment. I've seen comments calling this the best timed release of a piece of art in modern history, and I genuinely wholeheartedly agree. In a time when everyone was physically divided to a degree we'd never seen before, and in a year where social division was about to reach a lifetime peak later that summer, this unified piece of art calls on everyone to bring just a little slice of happiness from their lives, to brighten the world around them for just a moment. Small pockets of the video are made by Charlie herself, but the vast majority of it is compiled split seconds of home videos from fans. Couples kiss, tears are shed, laughs are shared, rooms are cleaned, and mementos are put on display. There is a reverence and a worship for the everyday moments in a time when the shape of everyday life was changing forever, and it acts as a perfect loving time capsule to who we all were in those fleeting moments before everything changed, and a testament to the strength that we all had to exhibit, consciously or not, to get through it to where we are today. Who I was when I watched this Forever video, when I heard this album for the first time, is not the same as who I am now. In a lot of ways, I was in denial about a good chunk of my own identity, and in a lot of ways, I think this record, and hyperpop in general, was a part of what helped me break out of that cycle. One of my first big trans-awakening moments was connecting as intimately as I did with this album and other works in Charlie's discography. I love who I am now. For all my weaknesses and frustrations that I expressed earlier in this video, I truly do love the person I've become. But I also love who I was when this album came out, and I always will, because that confused 17-year-old boy is who made me the 21-year-old woman I am today. She's the one who had the courage to put herself out there and make friends online, to build up personal and professional connections, and eventually to really go for her dreams and start making art for the world to see. When I sing along to songs off this record, sometimes I'm singing it to or about my partner, yes, but far more often than not, when I'm singing these love songs, it's to myself past, present, and future. The album loves me and makes me love and care for myself in a way that feels impossible, and yet it just does. It all comes back to the title, really. How I'm feeling now is the same as how I was feeling in 2020, and will probably be how I'm feeling in 2028. How I'm feeling now 
in spite or because of everything, is love. Thanks for watching. <laughs>